This is a hydrologic, an application of a hydrologic model, a fairly large scale macro school, we call macro scale hydrologic model, I'll get into that a bit more. We're looking at, we're, we're, we're taking a step up, we're getting away from looking at small watersheds, we're looking at much bigger scales, so we're using a very a different approach, a different type of model than, than I guess what you've been, uh, than some of the results you've been given in the past. We're going to talk about results and how we've interpreted those, we're going to go into some conclusions and where we would see this going into the future. What I really wanted to point out though is this is the Fraser River. 217,000 square kilometer watershed and the, the outbreak sits pretty much square smack dab right in the middle of the Fraser River watershed. This is the largest more or less contiguous watershed in BC and roughly 75 percent of its drainage area is affected in one degree or another by this very large scale disturbance. So this is huge, this is big. This is big stuff, very exciting, very concerning. Again if we look where this Outbreak is projected to go into the future. Again, the, the, the area of the, of the outbreak doesn't change all that much, but of course it just gets more severe in terms of the amount or volume of pine that is affected or killed. So again, a large outbreak affecting a very, very large watershed. We're looking at the Fraser River above Hope, BC. The drainage area is 217,000 square kilometers. The main stem length of the Fraser River itself is about uh, roughly 1,400 kilometers at that point. It is a geographically diverse watershed spanning the coast mountains here off in the west in the Columbia Mountains and Rocky Mountains to the east, the Cascades. In, in sort of aerial extent, spatially though, it is dominated by the Fraser Plateau. And this coincidentally is, is where we get most of the pine. Most of the pine here, most of the runoff here. So well, we already see some interesting issues. It is a climatically diverse watershed. We get uh, relatively very dry conditions here on the order of two, three hundred millimeters of precipitation near Kamloops. We can get an excess of almost five thousand millimeters in some areas of the, of the Fraser down here in the Cascades. It's physiologically diverse. Vegetation can vary quite considerably. The type of vegetation, we go from alpine, subalpine, glacier and ice fields all the way to arid and relatively arid sort of uniform lodgepole pine. Again, lots of diversity. So the challenge, of course, is taking what we know from stand scale studies, from plot scale studies, from all small watershed studies and trying to extrapolate that onto what happens in this big massive watershed that is very heterogeneous in terms of its climate, its geology, its geography, its physiology. So our solution to that is we get into this issue of hydrologic modeling. The model we chose is what we call the VIC model. VIC stands for Variable Infiltration Capacity. Essentially what each grid cell does is it takes climate inputs of temperature, precipitation, wind speed, funnels it through the forest cover which is composed of various different forest classes. It essentially solves the water and energy balance within each of these grid cells. Whatever water is left over is considered runoff and it is routed through a stream network. That is a very simplistic representation of what this model does. Nevertheless, it also does a very explicit representation of snow accumulation, snow melt on the landscape, and explicitly incorporates the effects of vegetation, which is obviously very important for this application and the whole point of this application. Getting into the issue of the size of each of these grid cells, oh, remember what I said, 30 square kilometers. So we're looking at large scale patterns, we're looking at large scale effects. This is how the model looks if you were to put it on the Fraser River Basin. So we basically got the Fraser River broken up into uh, roughly 7,000 of these grid cells. The blue line represents the channel network that's in the model. These red dots are actual hydrometric gauge locations. So what we did is basically we, we selected a calibration validation period and essentially which gauges that we then settled on are those that were active during that calibration validation period. So the hydrometric stations, the locations, the points of interest and sub-basins that we settled on were very much then an artifact of that calibration period. Uh, the thing to point out here for the Fraser is this purple fuchsia color here is, is, is lodgepole pine and it spatially dominates the forest cover of the Fraser but then again it is more or less located on the Fraser Plateau. There are large, these gray areas are more or less uh, alpine areas, so, so non-treed vegetation, so high elevation, lots of snow. You get those in the, uh, the coast mountains, the Rockies and the Columbias. The remaining vegetation is essentially non-pine but treed vegetation. So again, a heavily forested watershed as you would expect, 
but dominated by pine, located predominantly on the Fraser Plateau. We have two forest covers. We have one for 1995, and we used the second one for 2007. Obviously, the big change in 2007 is a lot of the purple turns to red. And now we have predominantly beetle-killed or beetle-disturbed pine located on the Fraser Plateau as of 2007. These are, there are seven scenarios. There's the written in shorthand here. And he's, these are the disturbance types that sort of create these scenarios. And obviously we have a, what we call our baseline scenario, 1995 more or less at the beginning of the outbreak, so we call that our pre-disturbance baseline, 1995. We also look at 2007 to see what sort of the transition from 1995 to current conditions would look like, what's the hydrological effect of that. So we essentially go from kill all the beetle, or allow all the beetle to die, and progressively harvest in, in steps of 25% until we essentially have one large clear cut in the Fraser. Again, bookends bookends. It's not to suggest that this will ever happen, but it's useful to know what is the outlier, what is the maximum possible impact on this landscape. What will this look like? Start with Baker Creek because many of you have probably seen a similar uh, graph from a previous study using DHSVM on Baker Creek. What this does is we run our model using climate data from essentially the period 1916 to 2006. For each of these different forest covers, we just run the same climate data through it. We run it through for 1995, and we essentially generate this peak flow frequency curve, which essentially takes all the freshet peaks that occurred in each one of those years, ranks them, associates a frequency or return period for each of those, those events, and then compares that to its magnitude. Some other things to point out is uh, on this particular watershed, the red squares are what we think would happen or what we think the change has been just going from 1995 to 2007. This is how we would attribute the actual course of events in terms of its hydrologic impact. Our hypothetical scenario of letting all the beetle die is actually less severe in this particular instance. So in certain watersheds, the severity of these two disturbances can often switch. In, in one case, the hypothetical killing all the beetle is less severe than what is actually taking place on the landscape. When we go to the much larger scale, we go to the Fraser, obviously a very different story. A much larger watershed, very heterogeneous. Uh, what we see is obviously the uncertainty becomes a lot larger. The bottom line is this watershed, at this scale, is very, very robust to disturbance. Uh, there's been significant changes, a large area is affected, but that being said, a significant amount of runoff in this watershed comes from the Rockies, comes from the Columbia Mountains, comes from the Coast Mountains, where there is no pine beetle, and therefore no disturbance. The largest disturbance tends to occur on these more or less smaller watersheds that are situated on the plateau. Low topography, low relief, uh, relatively dry climate, forest covers that are dominated by pine beetle, no significant runoff from any of the alpine water, alpine locations in the mountains. They are the probably most susceptible to this disturbance, to the beetle itself and to harvesting in general. A lot of this, I guess, in hindsight is fairly self-evident. As Rita said, essentially more water more often, more quickly. As the magnitude of the, stir or the severity of the disturbance increases, we can ex expect the impact to get larger and more severe. There's, however, wide geographic variation in terms of where basins are and their size. That being said, one of the, one of the explanations for this is obviously the, the size of the impact area, the size of the disturbance area, correlates very strongly to the, the expected change in peak flow. However, there is some unexplained variation that remains. I didn't get to show you the slide, but I think a lot of that variation has to do with the particular hydroclimatology of each of the regions that we looked at. And this leads to where we would like to take this in the future to get a little bit deeper into some of the mechanisms behind what makes some basins sensitive and some not so sensitive. Looking at additional flow metrics, seasonal flow, low flow annual yield, uh, adding some additional points of interest into this analysis, and perhaps with the assistance of other people looking at perhaps more realistic or more operationally oriented disturbance scenarios.